Throughout history, Israel has faced impossible odds. But during the Six-Day War, see how a miraculous wind exposed a minefield to allow the Israeli army to pass through unharmed. And how one battle that took place 3,000 years ago repeated itself with the same miraculous results. Hello, Sid Roth here. Welcome to my world where it's naturally supernatural. I'm going to talk about a miracle today, a series of miracles that defies any logical explanation. 48, you just saw some video footage of the war, of Israel declared a nation and 12 enemy armies attack it one day later. <laughs> they didn't have an army. I mean, they were merchants and shopkeepers uh, in, 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 in the arts. They, they, they didn't have guns. They, they, they had a, a few guns. Twelve well-armed armies attack them. They should not have survived from day one. My guest, Hollywood film producer Bill McKay. Um, Bill, I am told that West Point refuses to study the battles of modern day Israel. Why? The probabilities cannot be calculated. Uh, the experts at, at uh, most of the military institutions, including West Point, have literally written off the battles of 1948, 56, 67, and 1973. They said we can't run the calculus on why. Is there anyone to your knowledge, that gave Israel a chance of any of the, modern day Israel a chance of any of their major battles? As I went back to study all the major wars in the formation of the modern state of Israel, uh, there wasn't one military expert in the world or major military power from the Pentagon to the Kremlin that would have put money on Israel's survival. In fact, they were unanimous in their predictions that Israel was going to fall in each case. Now, why did you decide to do this movie against all odds? Well, the genesis of, of my experience with Israel and this particular television series uh, goes back many years. I've traveled Israel now 67 times in my life uh, and all over the Middle East. And I know many of the enemies of Israel. I have spent an inordinate amount of time doing documentary filmmaking uh, with the terrorists in the Middle East. Uh, so I've gotten to know the Middle East uh, and the Israelis through the prism, if you will, of, of terrorism. My first real big project was back in the 90s for the British Broadcasting Corporation. Uh, they'd asked me to produce a television series uh, to basically explain the Oslo phenomenon. Because at the time, everybody expected the Oslo peace process to actually bring peace in our time. Uh, yes, but the uh, title was vanishing peace. You did the opposite of what everyone expected. Well, that's exactly right. We and, were, and by the way, the uh, Oslo Accord, this was one of the first meetings to orchestrate a two-state solution or peace in the Middle East. Uh, and everyone was optimistic except Bill McKay. <laughs> well, initially we did not have a prejudice one way or the other. Uh, we thought that it was just another effort, if you will, by man to uh, paper over the very complicated issues between Arabs and Israelis. And so our job, our task by the BBC was to simply chronicle the events that were leading up to this grand moment when Bill Clinton and the world leaders were going to celebrate uh, what was the thorniest political issue in modern history. Well, when we got halfway through the interview process, we realized there was no peace. There was no there there. The politics of this process was an utter sham. So I called the BBC up when I got back to Jerusalem and I said, you're likely not going to want to have this conversation. But I said, Oslo is a sham. It will not produce peace in our time. And the British, as they can only be, said, well, yes, Mr. Mackay, uh, you're right. We don't want to have this conversation. Uh, and the net result was we terminated the agreement. I financed the rest of the picture. Uh, we went on to edit it. And the BBC actually got a rough cut, came back to me, and were so astounded by the quality of the journalism and our ability to document our prediction that the worst intifada Israel was ever going to face was going to be as an outcome 
of the Oslo peace process. So they rebought the program from us. We titled it then Vanishing Peace, The Aftermath of Oslo. Now this was released before Taba failed. Now, from what I understand, many top Israelis, from Mossad officers to politicians, were amazed that the BBC ran this film of yours. Why? Well, as you know, many of the leaders in Israel are secular humanists. Uh, they're atheists. They don't believe in God. They don't have the little curls and worship and all the rest. Uh, so for them, their Messiah, if they have one, is the M16. Uh, and when they saw that I was able to get vanishing peace on the BBC, which by many experts may be the most anti-Semitic political organ on the planet, next to Al Jazeera. Th that's why I thought BBC would never carry something like this. You must have been a hero in Israel. Well, Israel <laughs> assumed that, that, that I was walking in the footsteps of Moses parting the Red Sea. Uh, at least that was their words. Uh, as a result of that, Sid, uh, I developed some very close relationships with the heads of, of state in Israel, uh, prime ministers, generals, the head of the Mossad, uh, and interesting things started to happen. Uh, one night I was sitting uh, in, a, in a Tel Aviv hotel. Tell you what, hold that thought. This started Bill McKay in an investigation of miracles that are equivalent, when I say a, a great miracle, I'll say someone without an arm and the arm grows back. That is a great miracle. The miracles that he investigated with due diligence, with several witnesses for every miracle, amazing, amazing equivalent to an arm that's missing growing out. Don't go away, we'll be back right after this word. We'll be right back to It's Supernatural. We now return to It's Supernatural. Hello, Sid Roth here. Welcome to my world where it's naturally supernatural. I love the rarefied air of heaven, and you're going to find out about miracles that few people have ever heard of. My guest is Hollywood film producer Bill McKay. And uh, Bill, by the way, just as a little aside, you're working on such an exciting film. You're working on the sequel to The Passion of Christ, picking up at the resurrection. Just briefly tell me what this is about this. Well, about a year and a half ago, uh, I was in a meeting with the heads of Sony Pictures, and uh, we were putting together some other picture deals. And at the end of the meeting, this head of the studio turned to me and said, I have a script you ought to read. It's about the life of Jesus. Would you be interested? And I said, well, there'd be three conditions. He said, what are they? I said, well, number one, it has to be shot in Israel. I said, every motion picture from Cecil B. DeMille to Mel Gibson has been shot everywhere but right. the place where the story took place. He loved the idea. He said, what are your other conditions? I said, it has to be faithful to the Bible. And he laughed. He said, well, I'm Jewish. He said, I have not much knowledge of your Bible, but he said, my experts tell me it is. He said, what is your last condition? And I said, it's time to have Jesus portrayed as a Jew. I said, we need to deal with the biggest lie that has been perpetrated on humanity, that he is an Anglo. He belongs to the Jewish people, and it's time to tell that story. So we're now in the early stages of uh, pre-production. Uh, let uh, me switch gears right now because yeah. of time. Yeah. And we were talking about the movie you did for BBC uh, the Osl on the Oslo Accord. Yes. And that gave you great favor with top leaders in Israel. Late at night, they began to say the last thing you expected from secular, atheistic Jewish people. What did they say to you? They said, we've seen things on the battlefield that we cannot quantify in a scientific test tube. We don't know how to explain it. What we do know as military experts is that we should have been dead on that battlefield, or Israel should have lost that battle, or Israel should have lost that entire war. And yet the outcomes don't measure the circumstances that we experienced on the battlefield. So as I begin to investigate the surrounding elements, several things jumped out at me. Number one, going back to the Old Testament, I found that in many cases, Sid, they were fighting on the same battlefields that Joshua and David hmm. and other greats fought on. You had the same protagonists, the same antagonists, and the same supernatural methodologies employed by the Holy Spirit 2,500 years ago as you did in 1967 or 73. 
Let's talk about one which was amazing, these angels with flaming swords. Tell me about that. Well, interesting story. There is a very small town in the northern part of Israel that has been inhabited by Jews since AD 70, when General Titus came in and sacked the city. And Jews have made a determination that this is the land that was given to them by God through Abraham in a covenant. And so there have been a series of family generations that have lived in this same city and coexisted with the Arabs to prove God's purpose and plan. And just prior to 1948, uh, the Arabs decided, they knew the politics were, was beginning to shift, the British were planning to leave, and so a group of Arabs determined that they were going to wipe out the last vestiges of these Jews that were living in this city. And as they plotted their plan, the rabbi's house was surrounded by the Arabs, and they were coming in to burn them out. And as they made their way in the middle of the night, and as they got proximate to his home, they saw seven large angels with flaming swords at the ready, and every one of the Arabs scattered for fear of what they were dealing with. But some of the other things you verify in your film, it's, I mean, you think that's amazing. That's a nothing compared. Uh, what about the minefields? Is that unbelievable? Uh, set the stage for the minefields. Well, 1973, uh, the Golan Heights, uh, the Syrians were in control, and a group of Israelis, uh, uh, tank commanders, were, were sequestered from their units, and they were surrounded by Syrian tanks. And they were looking for a means of retreat because they were outgunned. And as they were preparing to make that retreat, one of the commanders realized that they were in a minefield. What, and, what, what is the probability of them hitting one of these mines? probably 99.9%. I mean, they were... So, so why didn't they just retreat? Well, because they physically couldn't walk out without triggering a minefield. So it wasn't just oh, a matter so of... They were, they, they, they were trapped. They were trapped. They painted themselves in yeah. a corner. Yeah. There was no exit strategy possible anywhere possible. So... I'll, I'll tell you what. I'm going to, in the next segment, I'm going to let you see some of this amazing, amazing footage. But how do you know this story is true? Well... There were eyewitnesses to the story. And as but did you find eyewitnesses? Yes, we did. Uh, I actually had searched all over Israel to try to find uh, the man that was in charge, the commander of that particular unit. And I couldn't go with the story on television unless I had found him particularly to authenticate this. And I was very discouraged because the story is remarkably powerful. Uh, came back to the United States. I was in a production meeting. And uh, Matthew Crouch said to me, my father, Paul, knows a man up in Seattle. I think you ought to talk to him. He would likely know some others that might give you stories for our series. So the connection was made, and in the middle of the phone call, it turns out David Yaniv was the commander that I was looking for. What's the probability of that? <laughs> Well, again, it's the same probability. I mean, one, one person yeah, in the world. Absolutely. The one person in the world that he needed, he just happened to talk to on the telephone. I'm going to tell you something. The miracles you're about ready to see are equivalent to everything you've read in the Bible. Don't go away. We'll be right back after this word. We'll be right back to It's Supernatural. <laughs> We now return to It's Supernatural. Hello, Sid Roth here with Bill McKay, and we're talking about the miracles in modern day Israel's history. Uh, it, it, the Our Service Academies, West Point, refused to study these wars because the results are too improbable. If there's no God, there should be no Israel. It, it's that simple. And Bill, you were talking when at uh, the last segment about you bumped into the one person in the world that could verify some major miracles that were going on in Israel during its modern day history. History, And we were talking on the Yom Kippur War. I mean, a, 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 a war that Israel should never, ever have won. They're, they're, they're praying in the synagogue. 
Uh, I mean, Golda Meir, from what I understand, was preparing uh, plans for a, a government away from the nation Israel. Things yeah. were so bad. At this Yom Kippur War, there were some Israelis that were trapped, and you found an eyewitness uh, with, about the minefields. Explain that again, and then we're going to see it. Sure. David Yaniv was a colonel in the uh, IDF, and he was a commander of this small tank force surrounded by a Syrian armada of tanks and he was in the middle of a minefield. So the options were absolutely limited and he then ordered his men to get out with their bayonets and tediously go through uh, the dirt to try to lift out these minefields and then disengage each and every mine systematically. How deep were the mines? They were over 30 inches deep into the soil. How do you find, I don't know anything about this, but how do you find all of these mines? You do it by simply getting down on your hands and knees and crawling through the dirt and with your bayonet, like an archaeologist with almost a feather-like touch, going through to find it because you, if you trigger one of these things, not only you, but your entire company would be blown up. But then a windstorm, which I understand is highly unusual, occurred. Tell me about that windstorm. Well, as David described it, he said that at that particular time of the year and the veracity of the storm uh, was so great that those great Sherman tanks, he said, I stood next to my tank and he said, I saw the thing rocking off the ground. And the wind was... The wind was rocking a tank? A tank. And he said, by the time the wind passed through this valley, 30 inches of topsoil had been blown off of the land, and he said we could see every single mine. What's the probability of a wind of that magnitude? Well, even more important, at that particular moment in time. It's not that there aren't great winds, but at the moment that David needed it, his men needed it, the wind was provided by God. And he then saw the, the exit strategy because he knew where the mines were, and then they were able to escape. I'll tell you what. This changed the destiny of Israel. Let's look at this reenactment right now. ‫לפעול <laughs> Thank you. 
Sid Roth here with Bill McKay. This is absolutely phenomenal. But if that were the only miracle, it'd be phenomenal. But the miracles keep increasing with intensity. What does a Jewish person that doesn't believe in Messiah, even uh, an atheistic Jew, think when they see these documented miracles? Well, as you know, most Israelis are secular by definition. Sure. They're not religious. And that's true for the most part in the United States. Uh, and it's been interesting, as this show has been shown in Israel and in the United States, the reaction among secular Jews uh, is absolutely electrifying. I mean, I, my sense is Jews are spiritual by nature, even if they are not uh, attending synagogue and, and are committed to their religious values. There's something innately spiritual about their character. And when they see something authentic or something that, that sparks that uh, supernatural touch inside of them, there is a recognition of truth. And I'll tell you, some of the best reactions I've had to this series have been from secular, non-believing Jews. We're talking with Bill McKay, Hollywood film producer, about his series, Against All Odds. He has done brilliant investigative reporting, documenting modern day miracles that would rival the miracles you've read in the Tanakh, you've read in the scriptures, you've read in the Old Testament, the New Testament. Uh, you, you've heard of anywhere. These miracles are so phenomenal. It's equivalent. The miracles in modern day Israel are equivalent to someone missing an arm and someone praying for them and the arm growing totally out. I mean, it, 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 you, you have to see them. You have to, uh, Bill, it must have been hard for you to believe these miracles and, and your life is a miracle. You should have died if God had, didn't perform a miracle as a young man, but it still must have been hard for you to believe. Well, it is because I think even as Christians uh, who embrace the supernatural and understand that God created the heavens and the earth and has purpose for our lives and all the rest, that when you're confronted uh, with a collection of facts that suggest arguably that something should not exist, particularly the Israelis, I mean, they should not exist on the planet. One of the things we researched and determined was that they are the only people group on the planet that have ever been displaced from their land to return again, not once, but twice. This has never happened in the history of the world. And they've been hunted down, Sid, by every major superpower except the United States. And they are, have not just survived, but they have thrived. Let me, let me wait till you hear this story about a modern day hero, uh, uh, General Kalani. Tell me about him. Very interesting man, uh, and one who has a, a deep spiritual sense of who God is. And in 1967, he was involved in a vicious tank, tank battle with the Egyptians in the Sinai. His tank was literally blown out of the sand, and he found himself uh, on fire in the belly of his tank. And he clawed his way out of that tank and was literally rolling through the sands of the deserts to try to extinguish the flames. And in those nanoseconds, he called on the name of the Lord. And he said, I don't know if there is a God out there, but if there is, I want to make peace with you. And in his own feeble way, he constructed whatever the sentences were that allowed prayer to come out of his soul. And he said, God, if you want my life, I will give it to you. At the time, nothing miraculous happened other than he lived. Uh, but he, he should have never been able to re-enlist no, in the military. He, he, uh, they went back to do all the medical testings afterwards, and you have to score a 92 on an Israeli scale, which is very tough. He scored a 32 when the surgeon was out of the room because of his love for Israel and for the flag of Israel. He changed the score and <laughs> allowed him to go back in. Now, this is important, Sid, because in 1973, uh, when the Jews were in religious holiday, repenting for their sins as a nation, uh, the Syrians decided you're, you're to attack. You're talking about the Yom Kippur War. Yes, and uh, uh, young Kalani now, who is a little bit older, and a colonel, a commander, uh, was sent desperately up to the Golan Heights to stop the Syrian armada from an advance because the Syrians were planning to sweep down through the valley into Tel Aviv realizing that even if the Israelis could pull out one of their great miracles and survive, if we can destroy the economic industrial base of Tel Aviv, then we've won the war. 
because the economics will be the finishing point for Israel. And Kalani knew that he and his four tanks were the only thing that stood between the utter destruction of Israel and the Syrian army. Good time for a miracle. <laughs> well, he was not necessarily looking for a miracle, but when he gave the orders for his four tanks to move directly into the face of 600 tanks. 600? 600 Syrian tanks. How many did he have? Four. I said that's a good time for a miracle. <laughs> All of the tanks except for his advanced forward. They were in a state of paralysis. And he said that when he was in that moment, he realized that what God had done for him and through him in 1967 when he was rolling through the deserts and he personally faced death. And by God's grace, he overcame the power of death. He knew then why he had been rescued for this moment. And the fear of death was no longer with him. And he gave the orders and went straight into the battle. How it happened, no one knows. But for 72 hours, this man held off over 600 Syrian tanks. Now this is important, Sid, because it's not just a great story of a David taking on a Goliath single-handedly. But God was working somewhere else around the world that allowed that moment to take place. Well, you know what's so amazing to me is uh, I, I have studied history about the presidents of the United States. And I know the presidents that have been pro-Israel, and I know the presidents that have been anti-Semites. Now, one that I would never have thought was pro-Israel, that literally God reached down and touched, and literally he became president of the United States for this decision, and few people know it, was President Richard Nixon. And as far as I'm concerned, he turned from goat to hero in my eyes, and especially in God's eyes. We'll be right back after this word. Don't go away, you'll find out about a miracle involving President Nixon that spared the lives of Jewish people. We'll be right back to It's Supernatural. We now return to It's Supernatural. Hello, Sid Roth here with Bill McKay, Hollywood film producer. And Bill, that was an amazing sequence that we heard about. I mean, how does one Israeli tank hold off hundreds for, uh, of enemy tanks for, what was it, 72 hours? Yes. There, there is no explanation short of God, is there? There is none. Uh, and yet, the facts are stubborn things because not only did he accomplish the impossible, but while this David, if you will, this young David, uh, fighting off the Goliaths of, of the Syrian army, uh, he had no knowledge other than he was believing that this was the protection that Israel needed uh, in terms of her utter destruction. But while that was going on, uh, Golda Meir, the Prime Isn't Minister- Isn't it amazing? There's a plot beneath the plot- That's right. That God is working on. It's so wonderful, listen. Well, he's a great storyteller. And uh, Golda Meir was in, in a desperate strait because she and her generals had pretty much concluded they were gonna lose the war. They were preparing for a government in exile. Uh, she had been negotiating with Henry Kissinger, who was a secretary of state at the time. Uh, you would assume because he was an Austrian Jew that he would have had at least a modest predisposition for the Jewish position. No, he was the opposite. Well, his position was at that time, let the Jews bleed a little. And so she. That, that was before there were open mics, but that was his position. That was his Sad position. To say, a, a Jewish Secretary of State. So she kept trying to go through protocol That's with right. Henry Kissinger and got nowhere with someone with a, well, a comment like let's that. Let's put this in a little bit larger context. This is Watergate. Richard Nixon is on the verge of being uh, destroyed politically right. by his opponents and being brought down under the quid pro quo with Congress. He was to have no foreign adventures. All decisions had to go through the office of the Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger. And if he had a foreign adventure, that would put the nail on the coffin for his impeachment. And it would trigger the impeachment process. So there was a checkmate in terms of his power by Congress. And so Golda eventually exhausted every opportunity with Henry Kissinger. And she realized 
In that moment, there was no other option except to pick up the hotline and call Richard Nixon. And Nixon told the following story. He said, I received a call from Golda Meir in the middle of the night. And he said, I sat on the edge of the bed agreeing to take the call. And she was pleading, Mr. President, Israel will not survive unless you give us help immediately. Now, he said something that was extraordinarily fascinating. He said, when I was a little boy growing up in Whittier, California, my mother used to require every day after I came home from school the reading of the Old Testament heroes of faith. And he said, I came to understand and appreciate God's work among the Israeli people. And one afternoon, as she concluded her readings, she looked directly at Richard and said, someday, son, you're going to be in a position of enormous power. And with that power, you're going to be given the opportunity to rescue the Jewish people. And Sid, in that moment, he said, I heard my mother's voice as Golda was speaking to me. He said, I knew why I had been put in this office, and it was to save the Jews. Now, Richard, you could say whatever you want about the man. He was politically astute. He understood the consequences of the decision that he was about to make. And because of his mother's word, because of her love for the Jewish people, he decided then to stand with the Jews. And he said, Golda, what do you want? And she had a list. And she started down that list one item at a time. And he said, Golda, no need to even continue. He said, I'm going to sign an executive order right now. You call the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and you are going to be given everything you want. And with that executive order, the greatest shipment of material, military material, was airlifted overnight. And that's the link between the 72 hours that Kalani, by the power of the huh. Holy Spirit, bought for Israel and for Golda and for Richard Dixon. And that's the story behind the story. <laughs> you say you don't believe in miracles? I've got a Hebrew word for you. You're just plain mashuga. I mean, this is all verified. And in this, this uh, DVD, Against All Odds, I mean, you, you've seen some of the reenactments. These are at top Hollywood level reenactments. How many total, not in this particular DVD, but how many total miracle stories, I mean miracle stories, have you heard that were worthy of investigation from, from the modern day Israel's history? Well, we have collected about a hundred. Uh, I have been told by my, my sources that work with me over that that there are many, many more. The reason is the Israelis never talk about it. Why? Uh, because I don't think they know how to quantify a miracle. I mean, yeah, and I think, too, if a general were to ever publicly admit uh, that a supernatural phenomenon had taken place on the battlefield, it would diminish his prowess as a military man. Uh, it would provoke him to ask the question. Is there, is there any chance Israel would survive as, as a nation if the miracles you have personally investigated, and, and your investigation was very thorough, had not occurred. Is there any doubt in your mind that Israel would be ex in existence without the God factor? Sid, I have no doubt. And I'll tell you why. It's not to take anything away from the military capabilities. I mean, the Israelis have built one of the finest military machines in the world. And they've got resources and advantages and ideas and capabilities that are remarkable. But they're not enough. They're not enough to deal with 22 Arab hostile nations with a Soviet empire that is feeding and supporting it, with an Iran that is breathing fire down their, their throats and launching missiles in preparation for an attack. They need God, just as Joshua needed God, just as David needed God. The Israelis need him just as much then as they do now. And guess what? Us Israelis, <laughs> we need God, but guess what? You need God as much as we do, and you're going to find out when we come back about a miracle that if you think what you just heard was something, this is unbelievable, unless you believe in God and miracles. We'll be right back after this word. We'll be right back to It's Supernatural. 
We now return to It's Supernatural. Uh, look, I believe in miracles, but this is, you are stretching me, Bill McKay. Were you stretched? I mean, you believe in miracles, but were you stretched on these miracles? Well, in some cases, yes, because, uh, you know, I mean, I live in a physical world. Uh, I do believe that there is a God and, and that He is the creator of the heavens and the earth. Uh, and He certainly would have opportunity to intervene in the, in the course of men's events. Uh, but when you hear some of these stories, if I couldn't journalistically authenticate them uh, as, as to the detail we did, I wouldn't include them in the, in the film. In fact, I hired Michael Greenspan, who worked for the BBC, who worked for CNN, himself was an agnostic. This isn't a group of Christians that were going in to try to find stories that would buttress our yes. theories on why Israel survived. We wanted to take a hard-nosed, journalistic look at this, turn over every rock, ask every question, prove up every point. Now, obviously, you can't quantify a miracle in a test tube, but we could gather all the facts, and, and the basic thesis of the film is to say to the audience, you decide. We'll give you every fact, we'll give you every story that we know, but you must draw your own conclusions at the end of the day. All right, there, there's, one, there's one miracle. There's so many miracles we'd like to show you right now, but there's one in particular. It's got to do with French Hill. Tell me about that. Well, in the Six-Day War, uh, the Israelis understood the importance of Jerusalem. At that time, the city was divided, as it had been since 1948. And the great dream, the great hope of many Jews around the world was that Jerusalem would be united again as the city of David. And on that purpose, uh, a group of nine Israeli soldiers were commissioned to find a back route into Jerusalem so their tanks could follow in purposes of taking East Jerusalem. And a group of soldiers were moving up through an area called French Hill. And as they crested the hill, they realized they were being surrounded by 250 Jordanian soldiers. Now, Sid, what's really important to know is two things. Wait a second. How many Israelis? Nine. Nine. How, how many Jordanian, that Jordanian soldiers? That was the elite army of... Oh, no, the, wait, of the Arab armies, this was the one that terrorized the Jews the most because uh, these guys were tough warriors. And more than that, there was a savagery, if you will, much like when the Americans used to fight the Indians. Uh, the, the Jordanians would go into a lather and they'd begin to chant. And it wasn't just enough to kill the Israelis, it was the torture and the mayhem and the violence that they could inflict. So when the Israelis were surrounded, they made a covenant that no man would be taken alive, that they were gonna fight to the death. And so they dug in on French Hill and the Jordanians were going into their war hoop, if you will, and engendering a level of, of violence so that they could commit the atrocities that they were seeking in their own pleasure of war making. And when they got within 30 feet of the Israelis, they threw down their weapons. Why? In that moment, and this is, uh, everyone told the story afterwards when they were debriefed by the Mossad. As they got within 30 feet of the Israelis, they saw Father Abraham. Now the Israelis could not see Abraham, but they could hear the Arabs crying out, Abu, Abu Ibrahim, Abu Ibrahim. And they recognized they were something was going on. 250 soldiers are crying out the name of Abraham, Father Abraham. And simultaneously they threw their weapons down at the feet of the Israelis. Now the Israelis are expecting death and destruction. And in that moment, they were paralyzed. And, and, and I might add, on those odds, there was not one chance the Israelis would survive, and they were going to die, not a death, a brutal death. Let's take a look at this reenactment. <laughs> אני רק מקווה שגם בני דודינו הירדנים חושבים כמוך. תגיד, אתה באמת חושב שהם יכניסו לפה טנקים? לא, אבל אם הם יחליטו... חבר'ה, לתרוץ מחסה! הירדנים באים! מהר! 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 מאיפה יודעים שאנחנו פה? תגיד, זה משנה עכשיו? אני רואה כוח בסדר גודל של פלוגה. אולי יותר. 
תצמדו לקרקע כמה שאפשר, אולי הם לא יבחינו בנו. אין לנו ברירה. נקבל לנו תחמושת. אפילו אם הייתה לנו זה לא היה משנה כלום. לא יהיה להם שום בעיה להשתלט על הנון ולקחת את כל הצילומים והרשימות. ליאור! כן? יש עליך רימון בחגור? כן. אם הם יתקרבו, תשתמש בו ותוודא השמדת המצלמה וכל החומר שאספנו. קיבלתי. יצחק, קיבלת? קיבלתי. When they came to about, I would say about 200 meters, roughly, towards us, the next thing they stopped, and you could see there was this panic. And they started to shout. <laughs> Abu Ibrahim, Abu Ibrahim, which in Arabic means Father Abraham. To us, it didn't mean a thing. We thought it must probably be another Arab who came from the other side by the name of Ibrahim, which is a very common name. Bukhim, wait a minute. Bukhim. ראיתם את זה? זה באמת היה לא נכון. אבל היה אחד ג'ורדיין שהיה נכון מהגרופה. אני רוצה להגיד לכם את החקיקה. לא יודע אם ראיתי את אברהים ומן ורעיה המלאק ותחמלינה סיוף כבירה. That's only one of the many miracles that are in this special DVD, Against All Odds. Uh, Bill McKay, when Israeli soldiers see this video, what happens? I had an interesting experience in the 2006 Lebanon War, which just took place a couple of years ago. Uh, I got a phone call one day from a buddy of mine who was my line producer, Israeli, and he was on the way to the front lines, 32 years old, and the young boys had collapsed. They had no stamina, so they brought back the veterans. And his assignment with his unit was to go in and kill Hamas, the leadership. And he said the first night we went in, we were so terrorized. We were out of shape. He said the fear factor was unlike anything I'd ever known. He said we literally had no capability. We came back out of Gaza that night to our base camp on the Israeli side. And he said, I realized I had the DVDs from Against All Odds in my trunk. I went to my commander and I pleaded with him and I said, can I show these DVDs on my laptop to my buddies before we go back into Gaza? At first, the commander was resistant and then he finally relented. And all of these Israeli soldiers in 2006 were sitting around in the middle of the night in the desert looking at these DVDs that you just saw. And he said, as they were watching it, now these are all secular guys. He said, the spirit of the Lord came upon them. And he said, we believed that we could take the land back. And he said, in the middle of the night, we left our laptops, we went right back into Gaza. And he said, with the power of God's spirit upon us, he said, we killed a hundred of the leaders of Hamas. You want to talk about courage. We were listening a bit about Abraham showing up. Abraham says in Genesis, the 12th chapter, in his seed, God says to Abraham, in your seed, all nations will be blessed. Who was blessed from the seed of Abraham? Jesus is the seed. He's blessed you. Receive him now. <laughs>